Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Ferris Alray, and I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for Mattel. I also have the privilege to have the privacy organization tucked under, under me, too. Um, we're in 2019, right? Last time I checked. And um, we're looking at a lot of distributed systems, IoT, connected product, blockchains, uh, all these buzzwords. What's that mean? Like, what are we supposed to do? But I just want to take you back a little bit in memory lane. Uh, let's just go back 10, 20 years ago. 1995, email system was just taking off at that time. We used to send five emails per day and receive three back. That's interesting, right? There is a survey that was done in 1995 as well about do people prefer the internet or CD-ROM? 49% of them said CD-ROM. And in 1997, Time Magazine produced an article called Death of Privacy. At that time, they predicted that privacy is going to die. So we've seen all this. What's going on? Like, how do we do it? What do we do? Right? Is it done? Is the game done? Are we ending? Should we just give up? I don't think so. I'm going to let you in on a couple of secrets. Please don't share. <laughs> but um, before I do that, I actually want to give you a little bit of background about myself and how I ended up in, in this position or this location right now. So I'm originally from Canada. Uh, I used to work for Royal Bank of Canada, all right? <laughs> um, back then, Stateful firewall was the biggest thing. You put a stateful firewall, you consider to have a security. Uh, the data used to come from mainframes only. You don't go collect data from people, ask them to log that information. But, but, but what we did is we pushed on building something that was the state of the art at that time. And that was the direct investing for Royal Bank of Canada. Uh, everybody now take these things for granted. I can go online and do stock trading and make money, and it quickly happens, and then I follow the stock, and I see on my mobile phone. Back then, it was the biggest thing ever, or even advertising on the ATM machine. I got the privilege to be the one working at that stuff, building it, securing it, putting privacy in place. It was interesting. It was super exciting just to kind of backdate myself. Windows XP was the biggest thing at that time. Uh, <laughs> Uh, .NET 1.0 was another big thing also. And so everybody tried to kind of like jump the gun and go and figure out what's going on. And then mobile showed up, and everybody got confused. What do we do? Oh my gosh, there's that mobile device that everybody's using. And the consumer wanted to do basically their transactions on the mobile device. And so we started building on mobile applications, mobile banking. We took the banking that we did and we put on the mobile device. But guess what? What we learned is mobile devices cannot be trusted. We saw a lot of jailbreaking of devices. At that time, the iPhone 3 came out on all this, so everybody were like super excited. And so what do we do? Moving forward, I moved from Royal Bank to the Bay Area, working for a tiny company called Visa Inc. <laughs> um, we did a lot of work there too. They were embarking on the mission of going into the mobile space as well. Um, I secured 1,500 applications that was under my umbrella at that time. But there were some certain projects that enticed me to work for Visa at that time. One of them is the Apple Pay. Uh, just to give you guys a little bit of background, I'm going to digress a little on what Apple Pay is, so kind of for everybody to see what, how much work went into doing this. Um, Apple Pay technology wasn't super new. Actually, if you think of it, Apple Pay was released in 2014. I started working on it two years before release. Uh, so that puts us around 2012. But if you think about it, the technology that we've introduced to the, to the iPhone was actually called PayWave. It's a 10-year-old technology back in the early 2000. Uh, it was used and utilized in, in Europe a lot. And so then we took that and we put it actually in the NFC chip. We created an area called Secure Element, and we dropped the information there. But then privacy came knocking, and PCI 
regulations came knocking, they're like, hold on a minute, you can't put a credit card on a phone. Someone will actually grab it. And that's where tokenization was born. So the idea is, if we put a tokenized number on the phone, that if I write for you on the wall, it means nothing. If we create a digital CVV, and if we create a digital expiry date, on every transaction, it actually changes itself, that would be crazy. So we embarked on doing that, and we did it, and we achieved it. And it's a proud moment for me, because I was part of it, and we did it. But we were able to actually defeat some of the features that the iPhone or the Android gave you, such as your Touch ID. Were we able to actually replicate somebody's thumbprint and be able to do a transaction, conduct a transaction? So we said, hold on a minute. We can't be walking around with the phone, and someone actually can scan your phone and capture that data. So we actually created the proximity part, where we reduced the proximity of the phone, of the NFC chip. We turned off the power, and we brought it closer to the POS system. So the only time the power will kick in for that NFC chip is when the POS system triggers it. And for the thumbprint, obviously, we try to do other things, but that's more in Apple's hands, and I'll leave it for Apple to answer that question. Uh, and they move to, to basically uh, face recognition. Then moving from there, I moved to a healthcare organization. I took over as their chief information security officer. And healthcare, just to kind of set the context for everybody, it's a bit behind. And my apology to everybody that works in healthcare. I, I love everybody there, by the way, just so you know. Um, I spent awesome time, uh, but the groups in healthcare wanted to bring healthcare to the 2019 world, to the 2018, 2017 world. They didn't want to be stuck behind, but unfortunately, HIPAA dragged it behind, and not for the lack of information, but HIPAA had the right to do that because of the data that you're dealing with, PHI data. So what I was brought to help with is Introducing machine learning, so we're able to connect with the doctor over an iPad or our phone. Uh, then you're able to order your prescription through DoorDash. And then you're able to communicate. But as well as your physician will know a lot of your symptoms before you even actually talk to them. So they can start diagnosing you earlier before you even hit that you know, talk button or chat button. So that was an interesting space, and we did a lot of work in that space on, on how do you manage machine learning, how do you manage data analytics, how do you manage data collection in that space? It's an interesting space, but how do you do it, right? So there's a problem called the, the, the infer control, right? That data, it, it infers to somebody, somebody's life. That data infers to somebody's location. Right? Not, like, not like in a PCI space where it's an actual number. This is your real data. Uh, just give you a little bit of stats. If, you, if there were a 1,500 credit card numbers that they were compromised, on the black market would be sold for $10. But if there's one PHI record that gets compromised, depending on who that person that owns that PHI record, it could fluctuate. It could be anywhere from $50 to $500 and even higher. So see the complexity between them. And then comes Mattel. <laughs> Somebody asked me, why did you do th that to yourself? You go from, from PCI to, to PHI and now to COPPA and, and kids. Just as an FYI, my customers are eight years old. I love dealing with them. <laughs> um, they keep me going. And I have a lot of them at home too. <laughs> so. Um, what drew me to Mattel is, is the innovation that we're doing. First, when I got the call, I thought, hold on a minute. This is a toy company. It's Barbie, Hot Wheels, American Girl. Um, it's a lot of manufacturing infrastructure support. Um, I wanted innovation. But when we talked, I realized there's a lot of innovation going on there. So just to give you a little bit, kind of an outline, a contest of, of how the toy world evolved. So in the 1900s, I wasn't living at that time. <laughs> uh, you know, it was mainly you play with, with blocks and wood blocks, and 
that nature. Then in 1900, 1940, between that time, board games came out, teddy bears came out, everybody got involved, everybody got happy. Then Mattel came in around that time, then, there's gonna, then Barbie Hot Wheels came out. We just celebrated the 50th anniversary of Hot Wheels. Um, then after that, everybody jumped on the video game revolution. Everybody's like, wow, this is it. And then in the 90s, a lot of people, I don't know if you guys remember, but everybody started playing computer games. Everybody got involved in that. And we're here now in the 2019. What we're trying to do is personalize the toys. We still believe that physical play is important for child development. So what, I, what drew me to Mattel is we did not discount the physical play. But what we wanted to do is connect the physical with the digital. How do you do that? It's, it's extremely complex. You would think of it as simple, but it's not. It's extremely complex. And I'll touch on it a little bit, as well as talk to you guys about kind of the, the seven principles that we created, how we brought in the security by design, privacy by design. Another date on that is Privacy by Design by, was developed in 2009. But what we took it, we took it and we put a new spin on it and we brought it in. Because we think it's important. We think you should have it from the get-go. Think, we think you should be proactive about it. And we'll talk about that. I just want to share with you a little bit the complexity of Mattel. Mattel is a complex environment. It's not about just you die cast a toy, you send the toy over, it gets actually made, then it gets sent back, and then you start selling it. Mm, no, that's actually 20% of the exercise. Uh, there's more to that. We have our internal systems. We have the logistics part. We have manufacturing, the connected products, which we'll touch on a little bit more. And then there's brands. There are different brands. We're now into the film space. Uh, we have, I don't know, a lot of you probably went to American Girl and bought from American Girl. And uh, there's a bistros there, and you try to book a, 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 um, a birthday party for your, uh, for your uh, kids. So you know how it feels to be a parent. And for me, it felt the same. It felt very close to home. And then the privacy laws came in. So think about it this way. Mattel is a highly regulated environment. It's even more regulated than Visa or the bank or even uh, HIPAA, the healthcare. Um, there's uh, COPPA, we talked about that already, which is basically kids, their ages 13 and under. In Europe, it's usually 16. And then the Euro European Union came out and says, well, we must do something about data, because uh, GDPR is actually really data protection. That's all it is. And so they built up GDPR, and they put all the requirements. And I think California got a little bit jealous, and they said, well, now we're going to build something new <laughs> called CCPA. And, uh, and they built it. It will be actually effective 2020, so we better be ready. Uh, just a, another fun fact is 3% of the companies out there are actually compliant with GDPR. We're in 2019. It was released May 2015, 25, 2018. 3%. A lot of companies have pulled their operation from Europe because they couldn't support it. But it's funny. If you think about it, all it was is put a consent on your, on your site, and you consent, and you're done. But is this really privacy, putting a consent? You have the right to be forgotten, and you have the financial penalties. Just to give you a little bit of stat on that, um, it's either 4% or $20 million, whichever is bigger. They'll go for it when you're audited by, by uh, GDPR. This could be the whole revenue for some companies. So CCPA, they said, okay, well, let's invent on that. And what they turned around and they did is they said that now every individual person in California can sue that company just in case their information got leaked. And so a few months ago, we met with the FTC, and the FTC are on trajectory, actually, of building a federal-level law that is, I don't want to say copy because that would be not nice to them, uh, similar to GDPR and CCPA. 
and will be applied on everybody. So now it will be all over every state. And on top of all that, there are some senators that they're proposing jail sentences, so it becomes criminal, if there's a breach. Data loss, breach, then there's criminal records for a CEO, for a CIO, for a CISO. So you, we're not immune. Just think about it for a minute. And so let's think about it for a minute then. Is it your lawyer's problem? Is privacy your lawyer's problem? Or is it our problem? You know what's funny is that in a lot of companies, lawyers actually set these requirements. But guess who implements them? The engineers. And who validates how the engineer implemented it? Absolutely nobody in certain companies. In certain companies, you have the security team chasing them around and trying to figure out how it happens. So let's look at a little bit of, of, a, little bit of a, a timeline here. March 2013, that's when the GDPR law kind of got the rubber stamp. And they said, hey, we're ready. We can go. We can move. This is all 2018, by the way, data. Then what happened? Cambridge Analytics problem happened. And everybody panicked. Then the CEO and founder of Facebook went and spoke to Congress. And then GDPR became effective. And then California followed and built up their law. And they got the stamp of approval. And guess what's next happened? Marriott breach happened. So if you're noticing, the privacy laws are becoming more stringent, stronger than ever before, international, federal, state level. But yet, we keep seeing these breaches. What's going on? What's going on is there's a big disconnect between what's written on paper and what's codified into somebody to actually implement and do something about it. So I'm going to try to walk you through some of this. Um, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not going to go into a lot of details. More than happy to talk later on with everybody if they want to know more details. But I'm going to try to stay in a, in a way that I can give you as much as possible information to help you implement this in your, in your own world. So if you look at a complex system that, let's say we think of it as more like this is our IoT world or this is you know, our, you know, how we're going to develop blockchain or how we're going to put some in place. And off to the right, you'll see you have users in your, in your company that's trying to do some analytics, some monitoring, some, some enterprise directory dashboards, and you name it. And you know, they just bought their new Tableau, and they're super happy about it, and they want to do something with it. And then you have in your infrastructure as a service, you have all your app servers running, your microservices, uh, your machine learning. Then your developers are pouring things into it through DevOps. Then you have your platform as a service, all your API calls. We're moving now into you know, the, the Docker days, I think, behind us, last time I checked. Uh, and now we're into the serverless uh, implementation. And then you have also connected products, like devices, physical devices, connecting to, that, to this environment and doing something. Well, what could go wrong with this? A lot of stuff could go <laughs> wrong with it. As we said previously, the mobile device back in 2012, back before that, we looked at it as an untrusted device. Is it trusted today? I don't think, I don't think so. It's still untrusted device. So what are, what are the problems? Weak passwords, we've seen this. Uh, people posting online many, many, many passwords. Insecure networks. Nowadays, you walk anywhere and you connect to a network and you start actually operating, sending emails, doing all kinds of things. All data gets transferred left, right, and centers. Uh, we do have device management sometimes, but we're really bad at implementing it. So it looks really bad, and things go through. Pure privacy protections, they're really poor. They don't, you know, they're, they're not up to speed. And then a uh, few security updates methods. For example, if, you're, if you have an iPhone, it's forced on you. If you have an Android, well, it depends on the actual providers when they push it over. And then comes the cloud. People think, you know, it's funny, I used to work with someone and he would say, if you move it to the cloud, then you shift the risk, so don't worry about it. Well, it's not like that. 
<clears throat> the cloud creates for you the environment to actually use it, the speed, the agility, and you're always fresh in the sense that you're always able to spin off a new thing and use it. But the rest of the work is still on you as an owner. Think of it as an extension of your data centers. Your perimeter is no longer your perimeter. Back again to my dates. In early 2000, when we deployed the stateful firewall, that was it. That was amazing. You put them, and now it's your perimeter. Well, nowadays, it's not. Why? Because your cl the cloud you're using is an extension of your environment. Some people say, well, your perimeter now is actually your endpoint, your, your, your endpoint devices, your phone. Well, that may, may not be true in certain scenarios. You have weak identity management on it. How many times we figure out who actually spun off from, from marketing uh, a, a AWS instance? And how do we know what they're doing on it? And then they go hire a third party to build some for them that collects data and drop it in the cloud. And then the only time you find out about it if data start leaking. Um, how do you manage that? Then weak identity. How do you allow who to access what? Then you have memory resources exploitation, account hijacking, and malicious insiders. Then data analytics. It's funny, we're good at collecting data, but we're really bad at analyzing data. Uh, we collect that all the data. We don't do much to analyze it because we feel like it's good to collect data. And so, uh, so we collect it. But there's a problem with that. The more data you have, the bigger the problem is for you. So it creates for you privacy issues because that data could be related to someone. Again, it causes that issue. Uh, lack of real-time checks. There's data store issues. Uh, some, some breaches that could cause that. And then unsecure frameworks. You might use a framework that is not secure, and it could cause problems. And machine learning, we talked about that a little bit. Data harvesting, pattern, manipulations. Uh, obviously, in order for you to have a really strong model in machine learning, you really need to give the whole data set to the, to the actual person who's doing that, that model. So if you're giving that whole data set, that data set contains sensitive data. It's funny, even in security, I tell my guys that, hold on, whatever data we're pulling into our SIM better be clean, because sometimes we might actually pull something into the SIM that might have client data, user data, person's data, right? So then what did we do at Mattel? Like, how did we do all this? What we're doing? How we're solving those problems, right? It's, you know, I, I bore you enough with all the problems that I'm showing you. Well, hold on a minute. What's the solution? A solution, what we thought about, and especially in a connected product space, like we talked about having the physical and the digital world connected, allowing the kid to play on a physical element, the toy, and then once they're done, they switch over to the digital world and they continue playing and they don't lose that space at all. Because look at it this way. Kids nowadays, they know how to swipe before they wipe. Actually, my kids do that all the time. But anyways, <laughs> um, the other thing, too, is um, a lot of kids now started to just play on devices. The other day, I was at a, at, a, at a grocery shop, and I see this mom keep giving her phone to her kid, and her kid dropping the phone. So I realized that's a game. And so I'm like, okay, so I think we should do something about that. So our goal is to bring back this physical play because it's extremely important for kids development, for parents to be also part of that development, because today, if we sit around in the living room, everybody's on their phone. Nobody's actually doing anything together. I mean, even sometimes watching movies, you do it separately because, hey, I don't like this movie. I like that movie. And so you start doing that too. So, so that is being, that's being lost. But hold on a minute. Now we connected those two worlds together. Remember, my customers are eight years old. I'm highly regulated, what do I do? What's my chances of failure here? A lot. If that data leaked, I have a bigger problem than, than anyone else. Why? Because this is kids' data, right? So what we did is we devised a plan. We said, here's a strategy, and we also put principles. These principles may not look unique, but the way we implement them are actually unique. Security by design, privacy by design, and product development came together, and we created the product lifecycle. It's a risk-based approach, and we looked at the tools to be the right tool for the job. A tool is a tool. If you don't know what you're doing with it, you have a problem. 
So you want to make sure that you know what you're protecting, how you're collaborating together, and then what is the right tool for that job, the right processes. These processes should not be circumvented, so it should be simple. And there's governance and oversight over that. So the principles. Let's talk about the principles for a minute. Number one, simple objectives and purpose limitation. The purpose behind this one is you want to simplify what you're implementing. You do not want to make it complex because once you make it complex, it's not optimized. Therefore, your implementation is going to fail. So you want to simplify the implementation. And we work hard with our development teams, work hard with everybody to conduct threat analysis, to be able to allow them to think about simplifying their implementation and how they change it. So if you notice, we are super early in the cycle with our teams where they're doing the development, they're implementing privacy. We're super early. We're helping them. We're holding their hand. The idea is to teach them how to fish. Second one is data minimization. It's funny. When, when, I, when I start in a place, I usually see people have tons of data. I mean, today, do you really how much, do you know how much, how much data you have in, in your world? I don't think so. Do you know how many data stores you have? The answer is probably not. Do you know how many third party that have your data? I don't think so as well, too. I don't think anybody has 100% coverage on what their data is. Well, we, we should do something about that. So that what we did is we looked at it from upside down. We're like, we start with zero data. You should start with zero data, not 20 million records, not 50 million records, zero data. And we incremented that based on requirement, necessary need, simple objective. And that's what decides what data it is. And if we need to tokenize it, we'll tokenize it. If we need to anonymize it, we'll anonymize it. Then we did end-to-end -end security. Well, where's end-to-end -end security? Is that part of the space within the development world? Is this also in the infrastructure space? It's actually everywhere, end-to-end, -end, starting from when you start writing on a napkin all the way to release and post-release. Layered security. You've seen this many times. I don't need to harp on it a lot. You know what it means. The different layers to protect your environments. Uh, it is important. You need different gates. Remember, your perimeter is not your perimeter anymore. It changed. You don't have that castle anymore in the wall. It's all broken down. Least privilege. Again, same concept as the data minimization. Start with the least amount of privilege for whoever is touching that environment or that data. Fail securely. You're allowed to fail. You should fail. It's a good thing to fail. I tell my kids that you need to fail because that's the only way you'll learn. But guess what? You cannot fail and show everything. You need to fail and fail securely so you can learn from it, but don't cause bigger issues. Zero of trust. This has been overused uh, by so many people. We look at it differently. We kind of look at it more like trust but verify. Apply it in every instance. This is just not about network. It's not about the phone only in perspective to the whole thing. So then what happens if we took all that and we put them in actually the NIST framework and the privacy framework? How does it look like in our uh, diagram that we talked about previously? Well, you need to have your protections in place, your access controls, data security, and your protection technologies, authorization services, gateway services. You need to be close to the APIs. You want to be able to detect and respond quicker than before. Previously, you could have had enough time to respond. Nowadays, you don't. Uh, when I was working in a healthcare company, it used to be 48 hours that you have to report a breach. Uh, so that is fast. You need to be nimble. You need to be fast. You need to be able to implement all this. Know your assets. Even though it sits in a cloud, you must know your assets, and you must implement governance over it and a risk management over it as well. Because at the end of the day, you need to decide, what is my risk? How do I handle it? How do I manage based on that? And how I move forward to pre protect that amount of data that I have? Because it's the crown jewel. With that, I thank you.